Now let's move into other endocrine glands. We'll start with our pineal gland, which is this guy back over here. I always like to describe it as being a little tail to our thalamus. So if you locate your, the thalamus and look posterior to it, then you will find your pineal gland. And this is unpaired. It is known as being a part of your epithalamus of your diencephalon, if you remember back to chapter 13 on our brain and cranial nerves. And this pineal gland is going to secrete a hormone known as melatonin at night. And this causes drowsiness and helps regulate our circadian rhythms and has an effect on our mood. It's all even going to influence that gonadotrophin releasing hormone secretion. So when your body is ready for puberty to hit, the pineal gland has a lot to do with that in telling the hypothalamus, okay, you can start releasing the gonadotrophin releasing hormone, which then travels to the anterior pituitary gland, telling it to release FSH and LH. So before puberty, those hormones are not released by the anterior pituitary gland. Now let's move into our parathyroid gland. So we could see our thyroid gland, our little bow tie here in the neck, but if you look posterior to that, you could see these small structures on the posterior aspect of our thyroid gland. That would be our our actual glands. And there's typically between two and six of them, but on average, each individual has about four of these glands. And if we look at a histology slide, you could see these, um, oh, we're gonna start with our chief cells, which are these darker purple cells over here, and also the oxyphil cells, which are the lighter pink ones here. And so our chief cells are going to be responsible for making the parathyroid hormone. Remember that our parathyroid hormone will help increase blood calcium. So they can do that by going through resorption of our bone, basically breaking the bone apart in order to get that calcium out. We can also decrease calcium's loss in the urine by reabsorbing it in the kidneys. And we can also activate calcitrol hormone. And now for the thymus. So you wanna be careful as you're reading on your exam or any anytime you have this um, endocrine system that you don't get the thymus mixed up with the thyroid gland. Remember the thyroid gland is the bow tie looking like structure um, in the neck region just below the larynx, whereas the thymus is going to be made up of epithelial cells and we find it anterior on top of the heart. And it is going to change size over our lifetime. So within a newborn or even a child, you'll see that it is much larger compared to when we are an adult it is going to be much smaller. And typically we don't even see too much remnant tissue within our cadaver lab because of this. So it really is going to be large um, in childhood because it's gonna secrete thymic hormones um, like thymosin, for example, that's the big one. And that is going to help maturation of T lymphocytes, our white blood cells, so that we can really develop our immune system. As we get older, that's not so much of a concern and that's why this um, organ tends to shrink. Now let's talk about the heart. So obviously this is not a picture of the heart. I will get to that in just a moment. Um, but within our heart atria, so these would be our top chambers of the heart, it's gonna secrete a hormone known as the atrial natriuretic peptide or atrial natriuretic hormone. And this is gonna be a hormone that helps to lower blood pressure. And the way that it does this is as the atria in there, we have some stretch receptors and those stretch receptors, if blood pressure increases, they start sending a signal in those atrial walls and tells it to secrete this ANP so that we can work to lower the blood pressure. And our kidneys increase in urine output will take place and our blood vessels will dilate in order to lower that blood pressure. Next we have 
our kidney that is going to secrete a hormone known as erythropoietin or EPO. And this is going to respond to low blood oxygen levels. So that's what hypoxia means here. It means low oxygen within our blood. And so what our kidney does is by producing this hormone, we go to our bone marrow and we increase a process known as erythropoiesis or production of more red blood cells. And with more red blood cells, we should see that oxygen within our blood increases. So there's a little bit more to this, but we will talk about it in our cardiovascular uh, system lectures. And our liver is a huge um, proponent in what's known as the renin -angio angiotensin aldosterone system. We are going to have insulin-like growth factors here, and also this angiotensinogen is an inactive hormone. So our kidney is going to produce another hormone. I know we just talked about how it's going to produce erythropoietin, but it also produces a hormone known as renin. And renin is going to activate this angiotensinogen into angiotensin 1. And from there, we need a hormone, uh, sorry, more of an enzyme that is produced by mostly the lungs, but also our kidneys, that will change angiotensin, oh my gosh, I can't talk now, angiotensin 1 into angiotensin 2. Now, angiotensin 2 is going to be a huge player in helping to raise our blood pressure when it falls. And it does this by uh, doing blood vessel constriction, right, by um, constricting that blood vessel, making the lumen smaller, we are going to increase pressure and also decreasing urine output and stimulating thirst. So the more water that we are able to reabsorb in our urine or just by drinking more water by stimulating thirst, that should help raise our blood pressure by putting more water or fluid into our blood. And then another uh, endocrine or er, organ that has an endocrine function is the stomach. It's going to produce a hormone known as gastrin, and gastrin is going to increase secretion and motility in the stomach for digestion. And motility, I'm talking about the muscles contracting in order to churn and help digest that food. And then we have our adipose connective tissue. That too is going to secrete a hormone and it is known as leptin. Leptin helps to control our appetite by binding to neurons in the hypothalamus. If you have lower body fat, it's associated with less leptin being secreted and this stimulates appetite. And our adipose has other endocrine effects too. If we have excess adipose, then it raises the risk of cancer. Excess adipose will also delay male puberty. And abnormally low adipose will interfere with female menstrual cycles. So you'll see that um, a woman that is probably below her, what her normal weight should be, will start to lose her uh, period. So that is it for the endocrine lecture. If you have any questions over these, please let me know.